Welcome to episode 33 of Free Speech Zone. I'm your host, Bill Olson, and it's been just over a week since the 9-11 anniversary, and everything's back to normal. Well, not exactly normal. It's not what I call normal. Normal would be fully informed, and, uh, you know, nobody out there is fully informed. Not even me. Not even me. No, but anyway, the point is... uh, you, well, for instance, you've heard me allude before to the fact that people all around the world consider the United States to be the number one threat to world peace, the number one terrorism threat in the world. We certainly support most of the terrorism in the world, whether we do it ourselves or not, but one of the things you have to admit is that we are an you know, unabashedly, we are the world's largest empire, the biggest empire that ever existed. You can joke about the uh, the sun never setting on the British Empire. Well, that's the way it is with us. Now, we've got, what, it's over a thousand bases, but of significant size, uh, what, 900 or so in other countries? And like Jesse Ventura would say, uh, what country would we allow in our borders to set up a military base so uh, what's recently happened is Jesse Ventura became aware of an of an international poll that you know corroborates what I've been saying so our first video is Jesse Ventura talking about the United States being the number one terrorism threat The good old U.S. of A, the land of the free, the home of the brave, and the worst threat to the safety of the world. That's today's edition of What Would Jesse Ventura Do? Alex in the command center, take it away with some bad news, I think. Yeah, pretty much. So in 2013, a WIN slash Gallup International poll found that America is the biggest threat to world peace. 24% of people around the world said America was the number one threat, followed by Pakistan with 8%, China at 6%, and Iran at 5%. Governor, America was ranked so much higher than every other country, you're probably not surprised by this, are you? Uh, No, I'm not. And one of the reasons I'm not surprised is because I choose to live outside the country looking in for a great part of the year sometimes. And it doesn't surprise me because when you look over the last past 50 years, every war deals with us and we are the military of the world. Why is it okay for the United States to have bases in different foreign countries throughout the world and yet Would we ever allow another country to put their military on a base inside our country? No one would have an answer for that, because we certainly would not. The polls show right now, over 50% think we need troops on the ground to go get ISIS, and the war will continue on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And they think if they destroy ISIS, It'll come to an end. I got news for you. The only thing that will bring peace to the Middle East is for the United States to get out of there. Get out. And yeah, and on your note of uh, American foreign policy, so let's look at the last 50 years. You'll see that we've been at the center of war after war after war. Vietnam from 1954 to 75, the Gulf War from 90 to 91, and of course the Iraq War that started in 2003 and has led us right up to the recent rise of ISIS. So after 9-11, go ahead. Don't forget that war on drugs. Thousands of Mexicans die every year because of it at the hands of the cartels. Thousands of people die throughout the world at the hands of it. Afghanistan is the leading country that grows the poppies, and the poppy growers are aligned with who? The United States government. So how on one hand can we fight the war on drugs, while on the other hand we're supporting the poppy growers that the poppy produces the most heroin throughout the planet. Is that called hypocrisy? On that note, not just a war on drugs, but you know the declaration of war on terror after 9-11, with these wars on not just drugs but concepts like terror, do you think we'll ever be at peace again? No, because we are completely governed as President Eisenhower warned us. 
in that famous speech back in 60 of the military industrial complex. We got all the controversy going on right now about gun control because unfortunately these two reporters were murdered. So now it's all gun control. Yet you don't hear one, the advocate for the, the girl, her father, or anyone else except Jesse Ventura it seems bringing up the fact that the U.S. government is the biggest seller of weapons throughout the world. And people wake up. When there are these wars, the biggest casualties are the innocent civilians. So why doesn't the U.S. government, before they start telling me to turn in my gun, why don't they set by example and quit selling weapons of war throughout the world? That's what makes us number one in who will be at war, because we are the ones that create the weapons that we sell to Israel, that we sell to all these other places that ultimately lead to all these wars. It's profit. It's money-making, it's Halliburton and Dick Cheney and all the rest of the chicken hawk warmongers. War is all about making money for certain individuals. All right, well, let's now turn to our vigilant viewer responses to the question, is America a threat to world peace? First from Facebook, E. Scott Davis. USA corporate interests are the major threat to worldwide peace. Always have been, always will be, until the sheep take off the blinders. Again. It's our military does not fight for the United States people anymore. Our military is the strong arm for the international corporations. If you don't cooperate with them, get ready. You'll see the U.S. military not far behind. Also from Facebook, Lyle Brunkhorst, Obama is the threat to world peace, not America. Well, Obama just happens to be the man sitting in the chair right now. Would you say the same thing about George Bush 10 years ago? that he was the threat to world peace. It doesn't matter who the president is. So it ain't just Barack Obama. It's George W. Bush. It's every president right down the line. Why? Because they're controlled by the corporate money. That's why. All right, and here's the last one from Twitter. It is Mike Lakimiak. How are we, quote, defending our freedoms when we're stationed or invading other countries? Exactly. We are not defending any freedoms here. We are the aggressors. Think back for a moment, people, and wake up. Let's go back to the 1930s when a false flag operation took place in Poland and it got all the German people up in arms, which supported then Germany invading Poland, which they did. They invaded the country, they overthrew its government, and they occupied it. What the hell is the difference between that invasion and the one we did in Iraq? Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. They just happened to be in the Middle East. We happened to not like Saddam Hussein, and we probably made a deal with the Saudis to take him out, because they didn't like him either. That's it for this edition of What Would Jesse Ventura Do? Be sure to sound off at Aura.tv slash off the gr Okay. Uh, yeah, I was, we, we kind of cut it short because we were getting ready for the donation thing or something. But anyway, okay, he summed it up that, you know, we are the aggressors. We are the aggressors. Okay, but now in the old days, the purpose of empire was, you know, conquering. Well, we've already conquered everything. So now the purpose is collection of the wealth and concentration of the wealth in the hands of the few that are controlling this conquering. Okay, now one of the things that, that it requires is constant war. And there's two things I want to talk about. Con the constant war thing uh, requires, you know, putting in power generals and, and others that are willing to follow orders no matter how illegal they are. And uh, by the way, uh, in other shows, you've seen documentary evidence about the, the purge that Obama has done where he, everybody that you know, wouldn't pass the test. In other words, would you take an illegal order to fire upon American citizens? And the ones that said, no, of course not. Well, they were fired and replaced with generals who would do anything. So that, that's the type of general that we have in, in our military now. And what they've done <clears throat> is uh, in cahoots with the military industrial complex that makes so much money from the nuclear side of the uh, supply chain, uh, They've reclassified nuclear weapons in such a way that they can be used as part of the tactical arsenal with the decision-making power only at the lower general level without even having to go through the civilian control. So we're going to listen to Professor Tusadovsky one more time.
uh, talk about the dangers of nuclear war in this post 9-11 era. And remember, 9-11 was the coup d'etat that enabled the military industrial complex to take over and start doing their evil deeds in the name of America. Go ahead and... There has been much discussion and debate concerning the dangers of nuclear war. Yet if we observe the behavior of the mainstream media, what has been presented ultimately distorts the dangers which correspond essentially to US nuclear doctrine. The focus has been on the dangers by lesser nuclear powers such as Pakistan or India, the threats of North Korea, when in fact the crucial issue is the redefinition of US military doctrine in the wake of September 11, 2001. What was presented in 2001 and subsequently adopted by the US Senate is the notion of preemptive nuclear war against non-nuclear states as well as against so-called rogue enemies. And on the list of countries are not only Iran and North Korea, but also China and Russia. And this was made explicit in the 2001 Nuclear Posture Review. Subsequently, in 2003, a secret meeting was held in Omaha, Nebraska, at the headquarters of Strategic Command. We recall that that scenario was, was used for the Dr. Strangelove movie with Peter Sellers. And the representatives from the military-industrial complex, the large defense contractors, were mingling with US officials, uh, scientists from the, the military labs, and so on. And the objective was, on Hiroshima Day, August 6, 2003, was not to commemorate the tragedy of the Hiroshima bombings of 1945, quite the opposite. It was to plan nuclear war and involve the private sector not only in the production of nuclear weapons, but also in the decision-making process. And this was described in effect as the privatization of nuclear war. And following the formulation of preemptive nuclear war, the Pentagon implemented a major propaganda campaign uh, together with the complicity of, of uh, nuclear scientists, uh, emphasizing the development of what was called the mini-nukes, or the tactical nuclear weapons, each of which has an explosive capacity between one-third and six times a Hiroshima bomb. But what was distinct in this propaganda campaign was that ultimately these bombs these tactical nuclear weapons, the so-called B-61 series, B-6111, are, quote, harmless to the surrounding civilian population because the explosion is underground. And essentially what they were doing was rewriting the history of nuclear war. During the Cold War, under the doc doctrine of mutual assured destruction, neither the attacker nor the defender, namely, <laughs> namely the Soviet Union and the United States, would use these weapons because they understood that the use of nuclear weapons would, would ultimately lead to destruction and, and a World War III scenario. I should underscore the fact that today all those safeguards have disappeared and now nuclear war is in fact considered to be part of the humanitarian 
peacekeeping missions of the United States and NATO, and that there is a preemptive nuclear war doctrine, namely that you wage nuclear war to prevent war, so to speak, and to prevent conflict, and you use a new generation of nuclear weapons, which are called tactical nuclear weapons, mini-nukes. But these mini-nukes are not that small, and in fact they're not different from the thermonuclear bombs of the Cold War era. They're less powerful, but ultimately they can destroy up to six times what was the explosive capacity of Hiroshima. Now, what is involved in this process is is a, it's, it's a mechanism of, of falsification. It's, it's the idea that ultimately nuclear weapons will not harm civilians. Mind you that that was something which was underscored in, in uh, President Truman's speech on, on, the, on the 9th of, of, uh, uh, of August uh, 1945, uh, <laughs> calling, I mean, informing the US public concerning uh, Hiroshima, and he said it very explicitly. Uh, the, day, the world will note that we have bombed Hiroshima, a military base. The world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. A military base. A military base. Military base. And as he explained, the objective was to save the lives of civilians and avoid collateral damage. Now, that notion it prevails. That notion still prevails. And the tactical nuclear weapons, uh, essentially what has happened is that their labels have been changed. The specification of a nuclear bomb is mass destruction as well as radiation which kills uh, tens of thousands of people. Uh, and if several of them are used, then we, we have a process of escalation. It's very similar uh, to the process of removing the label from a packet of cigarettes. Uh, and th this packet of cigarettes uh, says, Paul Mal, this is what dying of lung cancer looks like. Okay? Now, imagine that the pack of cigarettes, from one day to the next, you change the la labels and you say, cigarettes are good for your health and do not cause lung cancer. Well, that's exactly what has happened to the B-6111 bomb. They say, this is, this is uh, a bomb, a nuclear bomb, but it is harmless to the surrounding civilian population because the explosion is underground, and therefore it, it becomes a peacemaking bomb. And subsequent to the formulation of these concepts contained in the 2001 uh, nuclear posture review, the Senate approved the reclassification of the tactical nuclear weapons and said these bombs can be used alongside other weapons in the conventional war theater and do not require the prior, uh, the prior approval of the commander of chi in chief, uh, namely the President of the United States. So we're no longer in a scenario of uh, hotlines between the Kremlin and the White House. We're in a situation where the regional commander, let's say US Central Command or US Pacific Command, can use nuclear bombs tactical nuclear weapons with an explosive capacity between one-third and six times a Hiroshima bomb in the conventional war theater and that these tactical nuclear weapons now are part of the toolbox. And what this signifies is that the, menu, the military manuals are consequently revised. Uh, the three and four star generals in the field will act accordingly. Uh, and they will choose a weapon system. Uh, and uh, they are not concerned uh, with uh, the repercussions of these nuclear bombs because their military manuals have replicated this, the scientific lies which 
which uh, have been uh, introduced uh, by the Pentagon and which now constitute a new era in uh, in, uh, in, in the use of these weapons, so that uh, ultimately what, is, what has occurred is a redefinition, uh, or I would say more, a falsification of the impacts of these bombs on civilians and the fact that nuclear war is on the agenda. Nuclear war is on the agenda, preemptive nuclear war is on the agenda, uh, and uh, they, these bombs are to be used against non-nuclear countries uh, in the context of America's um, long war uh, against humanity. Uh, that means in the Middle East, possibly on the Russia-Ukrainian uh, border, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that China and Russia are nuclear powers. China, also, uh, uh, China and Russia no doubt can respond to these attacks so that the world is at a very dangerous crossroads because an evolution towards a nuclear confrontation will inevitably lead us uh, into a World War III scenario which ultimately threatens the future of humanity. Okay, now... He was talking about the relabeling of nukes as, as conventional weapons, and that's what the Orwellian doublespeak has been doing all along. You know, uh, ignorance is strength. Well, we've, we've got another labeling that we've been talking about all along, and that's, you know, change the label of Al-Qaeda to ISIS, to ISIL, to whatever it is. Okay, and... Now, one of the things that we don't talk about in addition to that is, remember back from the Iraq War when the Kurds in the north part of Iraq, uh, in order to enlist their aid in the war against terror, uh, our country promised the Kurds to help them in their effort to make a Kurdish nation. Now, the Kurds are split up between four nations. They, it was an arbitrary division of, of real estate done by the British, and the Kurds were purposely divided up to eliminate their power. Now, all, all along, they've been trying to get back together. To, you know, the Kurds are in Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, and, uh, well, go look at the map. Anyway, okay, sorry, but we're going to get, we got to get into this real quick. So here's Lou Rockwell interviewing Sibel Edmonds, and Lou Rockwell just asks the perfect questions. I, I don't, haven't watched much of his show, and, you know, I have permission from Sibel to play this, but, you know, I might get a copyright violation from Lou Rockwell, but I just got to say, he did a super job, so let's play this. And I'm, I'll be back next week if you don't see me by the end of this. Well, good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and it's great to have as our guest, Sibel Edmonds. Sibel uh, has been on before. She's always one of our most popular, most listened to guests. And if you've not heard her before, you're going to understand why that's the case. Uh, she was a translator for the FBI. By the way, she's fluent in Turkish, Farsi, and Azerbaijani. And because of what she knew about 9-11 was silence, a, a total violation of her civil liberties and of what it is supposed to be the case in the United States. She was a silence and not allowed to speak for a very, very long time. And I, I imagine some of that stuff still applies to you, Sabelle, but of course you exercise your free speech and you exercise your f free writing. And you're the author already of two very important books. First is Classified Woman, the, the Sabelle Edmund story. Very, very, uh, it could be fiction, except that it's unfortunately all too real as to what happened to her. And then also The Lone Gladia, which is a novel, a novel uh, in the uh, tradition of the Romana Clef. It tells the truth, talks about real people, but in order to avoid um, a hit squad, whatever, they are uh, uh, they have fictional names. Uh, now she's working on an, another book. I think Sibel has to do with uh, the detention centers, black sites, the various CIA camps established around the world to uh, where they'd like to put many of us. Sibel Edmonds is one of those polymaths on foreign affairs and uh, intelligence matters. She could talk about 101 different things, but today we're going to talk about what the empire is doing in Turkey, in the Kurdish areas, 
and in that part of the world and why ISIS is not some terrorist group that sprung up out of the soil uh, just by magic, but was actually a creation of the U.S. Well, you hit the highlight of uh, the issue, the topic of what has been happening in Turkey, with Syria, with the uh, what they call the Kurdish issue. And yes, the empire has been very successful, highly successful to maintain the uh, divide and chaos in the region for the ultimate purpose of um, dominance in the region. And for that, of course, it has been playing various chess pieces. And many of these chess pieces uh, are part of the empire side, not as it is being talked about uh, in the mainstream media as either independent actors such as ISIS or Assad's regime, per se. And of course, they've murdered an unbelievable number of people in Syria and the people that the U.S. is supporting to overthrow Assad and company have promised that they're going to ethnically cleanse the few remaining Christians, Christians who have lived uh, successfully in Syria uh, since the time of the apostles, many of them uh, already pushed out. They'll push out the remainder and probably kill many more. And they also intend to kill all the Alawites. It's the uh, uh, Muslim sect that uh, uh, Assad and his family belong to. So there's going to be much more blood on the empire's hands, but I guess they like it. They must enjoy it. The, they must be the sort of figures who actually enjoy killing people, bombing, destroying, wrecking. They must get a charge out of it. Absolutely. Uh, I have been, lately, I have been using the term I coined, I call it ISIS or us. Huh. <laughs> right. Because it is. And this is not any kind of a speculation or conspiracy theory. In 2011, between October and December of 2011, at a BFP report, Boiling Frogs Post, uh, we broke uh, exclusive news story about U.S. NATO forces in southern Turkey. U.S. has a base. It's called Injilik Base. It's in southern Turkey. It's close to the Syrian border, Turkey-Syria border region. And that the fact that based on sources in Turkey, based on, and these include um, the military sources in Turkey, and two sources here with U.S. military, we broke the story about how the United States, NATO, Turkish uh, forces were bringing in these factions from Syria into the base, training them, military training, arming them, and then funneling them back into Syria for the purpose of creating this chaos and also this entire opposition to Assad. Well, whatever they say today and whatever the U.S. media is saying is absolutely contrary to, to the facts, to the truth. These are the people we trained for this exact purpose. It started as ISIL and then became ISIS, now short IS. These are the people, many, many of them, thousands of them, we, the United States, together with NATO forces and Turkish, with the cooperation of the Turkish forces, we brought them into Turkey, we trained them, we armed them, and we funneled them back into Syria. So now they are trying, the media and the United States, the Western world, they are trying to distinguish between ISIS and some real opposition to Assad in Syria. And then, of course, there's this faction, the question of the Kurdish faction there, who have been also armed and trained by the United States, who are saying that they are fighting against ISIS, but actually ISIS is on our side. So you are looking at this complete chaos and mess that was artificially designed per plans and put in place for the ultimate goal of moving forward with the imperial pursuits. Yet, when you look at the media, and unfortunately, the take of the majority here, thanks to the media and what they are being fed, we are looking at a replacement brand for Al-Qaeda. In fact, this is what I have been talking about, writing about lately. This is changing one brand to another brand. It's all about marketing. 
and it exhibits main marketing features in it. When one brand starts losing its reach and its power, sometimes you change your logo, you rebrand your product or what you're doing, your service. And that's exactly what we have been doing with this phenomena called ISIS. And if you look at the marketing scheme, it's not different. In fact, it is identical to the marketing promotional methods that we practiced the United States together with its arm in the media with Al-Qaeda. I just put together this show a few days ago and I put them side by side. I put the headlines from 2002 to 2004 when Al-Qaeda was heavily being promoted. It went from some Afghan cells into they are all over Europe, they are mushrooming. The fact that they have biological weapons capability, chemical weapons capability, they have even suitcase nuclear bombs. And actually, I put them one by one and compared word by word with the promotional marketing material being fed to the public by the U.S. mainstream media with ISIS using exactly the same features. They went from hundreds and thousands into their all over Europe. They have 12 cells in Belgium. They have 18 cells in France. Some of them are doctors. Some of them are surgeons. Some of them have blue eyes. And lo and behold, in the past two months, New York Times and Wall Street Journal and Guardian UK, they have been selling the idea that they have biological weapons. They have chemical weapons. They are seeking nuclear weapons. Further, I compared and contrasted to what we did with Al-Qaeda's supposed so-called financial network. First, it was said in 2002 that Al-Qaeda and bin Laden, they had $150, $200 million net worth as as a terror organization. By 2005, they made that number to be somewhere between $1 and $2 billion. Well, they are doing the same thing. The current headlines from these mainstream media publications actually is saying, ISIS is currently the wealthiest terror organization, and this is the exact headline, on the planet, on the planet. They have but you're not counting the CIA. <laughs> right. So the marketing material is the same. The brand has changed, as we did with Al-Qaeda in 1980s against the Soviet Union, how we trained them, how we worked, you know, the CIA with Al-Qaeda, including bin Laden. Well, the same thing is holds true for ISIS. And it was not that long ago. We don't have to go back 30 years. This started around the same time we began the offensive against Libya. And this was simultaneously was being done in Turkey using our ally NATO member Turkey and the base there. And of course, the strategic locations to carve out the same kind of situation with Syria. And of course, it was expected initially in 2011 when the CIA, NATO forces created ISIS, that it was going to be a fairly quick, maybe like maybe a little bit longer than Libya, but six months to a year operation. But what happened was, lo and behold, the whole issue started to have taking place in, in Ukraine. And with Russia's opposition, this entire scenario and the script that was put in place on Syria was placed on the back burner temporarily for a year, a year and a half. And as soon as, and if you look at the timing, as soon as the issue with Ukraine started kind of calming down and quieted down, bam, we had this explosive richest and the biggest terror organization on the planet, ISIS being hyped up again. And also the other unexpected element here was what was going to happen, how the empire, imperial powers were going to play out this whole delicate issue of Turks and Kurds, because they don't have any problem, Turkey, to join forces and basically do the dirty work for the U.S. and NATO and go and bomb the hell out of the Syrian and go into the airstrikes, etc. However, United States and NATO, they have been also partnering up with the Kurds in that region. And that is a very touchy, sensitive issue with Turkey, because Turkey also has a second front war with the 
Kurdish minority both in Turkey but also in northern Iraq and in northern Syria. So they have been in this dance negotiation position for the past few months, the United States and Turkey. U.S. says, well, you are using our air missiles and our weapons against the Kurds instead of Syria. And Turkey has been saying, if you want our partnership in what you're doing with your imperial pursuits, you have to get away, get out of this partnership with the Kurds. And that's exactly where we are currently with the situation in this trio U.S. Kurds issue and Turkey. You know, I noticed that there have been some U.S. senators who have urged the U.S. to form a Kurdistan <laughs> and to arm it, but I don't hear that talk anymore. Of course not, because that is, that would be an absolute no-no area for Turkey. That issue came up during the first six months of our setup offensive against Iraq in 2002-2003, and that was the main reason Turkey, for the first three years, they objected and they said the United States cannot use the air base and Turkey for its operations and including logistics in its war with Iraq. And the reason that that came about, which mainstream media really didn't ever bring it up, had to do with the issue of the Kurds, because in that case, the United States was also forming this partnership training the Kurds in northern Iraq. They are basically finding themselves in the same position, because one of the things that Brits are good at, and U.S. and Britain, they both do, when they basically pull out of the hat the Kurdish maneuver, what they do is they go and they give them this promise that in return for their help, they are going to look into carving out this portion from northern Iraq so the Kurds can have the free, independent Kurdistan region. Kurds currently are the largest minority in the world without land, without their own country. I mean, you're looking at uh, just Turkey alone has about 10, 15 million Kurds. And if you start adding the Kurds in northwestern Iran, the Kurds in northern Iraq, the Kurds in northern Syria, you're looking at a very, very large population that has been in this battle of uh, getting their own independent nation. So they make these promises, the Western Empire, and then once they are finished utilizing the Kurds, they feed the Kurds into the back into the wolves, meaning then they go to Turkey and say, we're done with them. Now you can go bomb the hell out of them and we will never talk about the Kurdistan issue, etc. And you would think that after so many times being used in this kind of scheme, the Kurds would kind of be more awake of knowing that these are basically hollow, baseless promises that they actually are being strategically used for whatever purpose the West has. But obviously, they are not learning any lessons because they are finding themselves the situation exactly the same as before. And they are very well armed and very well trained, and they are very capable. They are very good in guerrilla warfare. They are very good in, in maneuvering within those porous, mountainous regions. So as far as the forces goes, militaristically, it is, of course, a great strategy for the Western Empire to use the Kurds. But as before... As we are going to see what's going to happen between Turkey and U.S. negotiation, they are always a card negotiation card that can be disposed of at any given moment. And we are going to see what's going to happen with that bargaining dance that currently taking place between U.S. and Turkey. So, Bell, aren't the Kurds a, sort of a dependency of Israel as well? I mean, I, I remember this many years ago when I would read William Sapphire, the late William Sapphire's column in the New York Times, and I can't tell you how many times he said, oh, the Kurds, they're great, they're great people, wonderful, you know, wonderful. <laughs> and uh, so, so uh, I mean, what's, what's the story there? Well, you touched upon a highly blacked out fact story, and that is what took place between 2003 and 2006 in northern Iraq. What happened was, as we went and had our aggression against Iraq and we got rid of Saddam during all this time period, Israel and its forces, both military and intelligence, they went and they forged these alliance with one of the most powerful Kurdish factions in northern Iraq. They said, and this is Israelis, they said, look, 
let's have a partnership. We want to install military and intelligence base right here in northern Iraq, which borders northwestern Iran, okay? So this is right on the border area with Iran. In return, we will give you arms, we will train you in all sorts of military trainings, including commando warfare. And also, of course, we represent some of your interests with, you know, with the Western Empire, with Washington. So this alliance was formed and Israel went into northern Iraq and they actually had and put place and they still have it, these bases, covert yet formal bases, intelligence and military bases in northern Iraq. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happened was this really ticked off Turkey and the Turkish government and Turkish military. So behind the scene, they were carrying out this basically letting off big time steam to U.S. and saying you have to interfere with this and this has to stop. And we will not tolerate Israeli bases in northern Iraq when they are forging this partnership with our enemy, the terrorist Kurds. That's what Turks call them, the terrorist mm -hmm. Kurds. Well, U.S. really didn't do anything. They just sat there. Of course, we know that our foreign policy is completely guided and managed by Israel's interest in the United States. And after a while, Turks said, fine, if you're not doing anything, we're going to take the matters into our own hands. So what they did was they formed their own special intelligence and military operatives and units, and they basically went into northern Iraq in order to both gather information, but also when opportunity arise, interrupt some of this activities, operations by the Israeli Kurdish alliance in northern Iraq. But what happened was, at this point, the U.S. intelligence were tipped off by Israel that, yes, the, they, they had identified these Turkish operatives, this military intelligence unit in northern Iraq, but in order to keep everything covert, they didn't want to do anything themselves, Israelis. So they basically ordered they asked, asked would be mild, it would be more like ordering, the U.S. military through State Department and Pentagon saying, we want you to go and get rid of these units and basically kick them out of here. So while some of these high levels, some of them were lieutenant generals, okay, in this covert operations station in northern Iraq trying to find out what they were doing Israeli with their Israel base and, and the Kurds, lo and behold, they're in the middle of this eavesdropping operation and they had this unit from U.S. military, Pentagon, storming inside, grabbing them, handcuffing them and putting bags on their head, you know, heads, just like the way they do it with the detainees for Guantanamo. But you are looking at high level military officers, Turkish military officers, ally nation, NATO member. Well, this became a huge scandal and actually it became front page news in, in the United States, minus the fact that why these units were there, and there was no mentioning of the Israeli bases in northern Iraq and the partnership forged. So they basically blacked out that entire part of that story. So it became one of those mysterious stories that Americans read and they kind of scratched their heads and say, why in the world United States military, they go and they get ally nations, NATO members, generals, and put bags in their heads? Of course, to save face, U.S. Uh, formally apologized to Turkey and they said it was due to some misunderstanding and they released these generals, these uh, lieutenant generals back to Turkey after four days detaining them in Iraq. At this point, some of these generals, Turkish generals, who have been for two decades main sources for Seymour Hersh and Seymour Hersh, the journalist, they said, fine, we are going to leak the information together with all the documentation, the aerial photography of Israeli bases in northern Iraq and the operations, everything, we'll give it to him and have him exposed since Washington Post and New York Times, all these people, they actually intentionally took out the part with Israeli bases in northern Iraq. 
So in 2006, 2000, end of 2005, 2006, Seymour Hersh actually went to Turkey. And back then I lived in Alexandria. And he said, you know, to me, I'm going to go and meet with my general sources. He went to Turkey. He met with these generals. They handed him every single documentation, variable documents, aerial shots showing that Israeli bases exactly where they are in northern Iraq. Well, Seymour Hersh came back to the United States and that story was killed. He never published it. He never published it. And that that just really pissed off the Turks, and they went about making this nationalist movie called The Valley of the Wolves, which is a take on Grey Wolves and Operation Gladio. And I mean, this is a high budget movie. It won a bunch of awards. I mean, you're looking at 50, 60 million dollar budget movies. They made it in, you know, with, with some German production company, and they heavily promoted it, trying to let basically people know what that was about in a fiction movie. So I'm providing this context, and I know I'm kind of going really long talking about it because I know our listeners, most people in the U.S., if not all, they've never heard these stories. No. And these stories are such a, and they have been covered by mainstream media in, in not only Turkey, but elsewhere in the Middle East. But it was successfully blocked, blacked out by the U.S. media and the Israel lobby, of course. And we are looking at similar things coming into play with northern Syria and the issue of Turkey versus the Kurds. But that whole case of Israeli bases in uh, bases in northern Iraq has really never been exposed, despite the fact that even so-called award-winning Pulitzer-winning journalists, their allegiance are first to the Israel before it is to any journalism or the United States or the people in the United States. From Israel's perspective, you can see the value of being there in northern Iraq right along the northwestern border of Iran. I mean, they we already have bases there. I mean, when you look at then Afghanistan and Pakistan and you look at northern Iraq with these Israeli bases, Turkey, the NATO Operation Gladio ally in northern part of Iran, you are looking at how basically we have surrounded Iran in from basically every single border aspect, border points. There's a wonderful illustration of uh, the country of Iran surrounded by all the U.S. bases and demanding to know, why did the Iranians build their country so close to our bases? <laughs> right. And and with the latest, uh, the last two years talk with the agreement with Iran that they are trying to promote it as marketed, it, it is just like the issue of uh, Syria that was placed on the back burner when we were tackling Ukraine front. And then restarted again once that front went into the passive mode. Same thing we are going to see with Iran. Whatever you're seeing is temporary because currently we have Iraq and Syria. And once that is done, we are going to be back in the same situation with Iran. Basically being the last stop is the last domino in this domino piece. And also it has other benefits too. It is being played as one of the marketing and promotional points for Democrats, for the Democrats and Obama administration, you know, showing all people from that front as peace loving. Look how they were so compromising. And instead of being tough on Iran, they went and they put together and they pushed for this agreement despite all the opposition in Congress and the right wing people. I mean, this is going to be all played out that way. We are going to have election. And my prediction here, because we are on record right now here, would be within second year of whoever is the president, second to third year of whoever is the president, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, everything is going to be nulled, nullified with whatever this agreement that is being hyped and played as, oh, okay, so now we are making peace with Iran and we are no longer looking at it's imminent and there's going to be next offense, the last piece, Iran is coming. Because that, that piece is going to come, is inevitable for all sorts of marketing and strategic purposes and other indirect benefits, such as the promotional material for the current administration, it is being placed temporarily on hold, on the back burner, and it will be all reopened again. Sibel, what's happening with Erdogan? I mean, he's having uh, some troubles internally in Turkey. Is this a product of his own bad rule? 
uh, which I'm sure is like an, every politician, he's uh, ultimately a creep. Uh, or is this is the U.S. running some kind of color revolution thing to to weaken him or to make him be more obedient in terms of all all the things we're talking about? I think it's putting it mildly to say it's kind of in trouble. It is in deep trouble currently, Turkey and the political climate there. Uh, there are several factors. So it would be, I guess it would be simplistic to just say it's all U.S. doing and, or to say it's all his doing, his own doing, and that being him being uh, Erdogan, it is so complex. And I spent some time in the region. It's many fronted. We know that the whole thing with U.S. began with the West, with the Gezi protests in 2012, 2011, 2013. And we also know about the fallout between Erdogan and his administration, AKP party and Mullah Fethullah Gulen, the CIA Islamic front man for Turkey, the man who has been in the United States, Fethullah Gulen, since we talked about that in, a, in your previous episodes, it's yes. since 1997. Basically, there has been this fallout between Erdogan and the United States, and by, United, by the United States, I mean CIA Operation Gladio NATO, since that 2011, because we back that Mullah uh, Fethullah Gulen and the network we created for him for our operations, not only for operations in Turkey, but also other operations, covert operations we are running in Central Asia and in Caucasus, in, in Azerbaijan and in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, etc. So that was one factor and still is heavily at play with that fallout because his network, uh, his organization's network, Fethullah Gulen, is minimum of 20, this is the known part, $22 billion. Several major mainstream media organizations in Turkey are owned by Fethullah Gulen's network, including Zaman, one of the few English, they also have an English version, newspapers in Turkey. So that factor has been in play for at least four years. Then the second issue comes with what's happening Happening with Syria. And we have had in Turkey over 2 million refugees have poured into Turkey. I mean, the chaos and, and problems and issues that have created. Imagine for a country, size, the size of the country in terms of how big the country is geographically, you're looking at a country the size of Texas. Turkey is the same size as the state of Texas, okay? Now imagine you open the gate and not over 10 or 20 or 50 years period, but over two years period, you have 2 million refugees coming into Texas simultaneously. So with that, so much problems have taken place in Turkey from health points of view. Some of the issues that kind of were eradicated, they are back diseases. You have these tense refugee camps, not only along the border, in the middle of Istanbul, you get these people. And then you have faction of Syrian refugees who are going to workplaces and businesses, and they are saying, well, if you're paying, I'm just going to throw a number here, $850 for your Turkish worker, I'm willing to work for you for 200 So many Turks, Maybe I shouldn't say many because I don't have the exact number. There are workers who are losing jobs under the table. The, these companies, uh, they are hiring these Syrian refugees who are willing to work for 20% of that salary given to a Turkish worker. So that has been creating tension. Of course, you have the uh, other political factions who are carrying out their own activities. Then, of course, you have this latest terror event where the female suicide bomber blew herself up in southern Turkey. 34 people lost their lives, hundreds of people, they got injured. You have that situation. Most importantly, currently, and that is ultimate benefit for the United States and for Gulen's network is Turkey is at this brink of economic collapse because Turkey has been doing fantastic for the past 10 years or so. 
while we have been watching Europe collapse, collapsing during the crisis 2012-2013, Turkey showed very strong economic performance. The Turkish stocks went really and stayed up there. And of course, a lot of investments started pouring into Turkey while Europe was having all those problems. A lot of investment came from Arab countries. They found the climate and Turkey good for their future investments. So you had Saudis and Kuwaitis and United Arab Emirates with lots of money, billions of dollars, investing heavily in Turkey. And those uh, the investments, much of it went into building and improving infrastructure. And I have to say they have done amazing works, whether it is building additional highly important bridges, tunnels, metro system, other kinds of construction projects, dams. As a result, they also ended up having this bubble created in Turkey, especially real estate uh, bubble. You see, Turks are about, if you were to throw a number, 25, 30 years behind U.S. in things. For example, in Turkey, 25 years ago when I was there, nobody used credit cards, okay? Everybody believed in cash, cash in hand. So people bought what they could afford with cash. I mean, you you went with a little briefcase full of cash and you bought, and sometimes foreign, foreign currency because Turkish lira has always been volatile, and you bought yourself a house. You know, you pay $300,000 in cash. Didn't, they didn't even use check. About 15 years ago, the, the use of credit cards, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, started getting really promoted in Turkey. And just like with U.S. real estate scheme that took place in 2006, 2005, all the way till the collapse in 2008, they introduced this extremely not fixed low interest rates for buying homes. So people, you know, in Turkey, being so new into this whole concept of spending the money you don't have, they started doing it and they started, and this is right now this case, there's the big, big real estate bubble. And then you have people with huge level of debts on credit cards. They are spending the money they don't have and they haven't experienced the hit that comes as a consequence of this change. That point is nearing. And when I'm saying nearing, I'm not talking about a year. I'm talking about a few months maximum, because with the situation of political instability, and that is there is no majority government, they're going to have another elections in November. They fail to form a coalition government with the opposition. So you have this political, unclear political situation, which affects the stock market for Turkish stocks. Then you had these terror incidents and the situation with Syria, and that this year affected the tourism industry tremendously. It hit it so very hard. And tourism industry is the second or the third large economic industry in Turkey. They had a lot of European tour groups, etc., who canceled their trips to Turkey. You know, they don't want to be visiting some historic mosque in, in Istanbul and a suicide bomber blows herself up. So tourism got hit tremendously.